My name is Jeffrey Herbst. I am president of American Jewish University. Today is a very special program. I'm delighted to welcome Dennis Ross and David Makovsky uh, to our platform. Both are friends of American Jewish University and both have long distinguished bios as observers and participants in Middle Eastern negotiations over the decades. Ambassador Ross has served as the point person for Middle East negotiations in both the H.W. Bush and Clinton administrations and was an advisor to Secretary of State Clinton and President Obama. David Makovsky is the Ziegler Fellow at the Institute for Near East Policy. Um, and that, of course, is a very special name uh, because it is also the name of our rabbinic school, the Ziegler School. Uh, we're grateful for the Ziegler family uh, for supporting both uh, the Institute and the uh, American Jewish University. Dennis and David, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Glad to be with you. We advertise this as the advanced class in Middle East negotiations, so let me get right to it. The other day, at least on the Hebrew calendar, we noted the 15th anniversary of the withdrawal from Gaza. Um, this was, one, of course, one of the few instances in human history where a country had withdrawn from territory. Um, and uh, the past 15 years has been challenging with the takeover of Gaza by Hamas, missile attacks, wars, uh, and a lot of tension along the border. As we look to possible future Middle East negotiations, what do you think the lessons are that Israeli leaders have drawn and should draw uh, from the Gaza withdrawal? So why don't I, I start with that? Uh, the question's interesting, not only because lessons should be drawn when you take a step like that, uh, but you're asking a question uh, that is both what have they drawn as well as what should they draw? So let's start with the, the have before we get to the should. I think the, the main lesson that was drawn was not that it was a mistake to get out of Gaza because there is nobody who is arguing within Israel to go back into Gaza and to assume responsibility again for Gaza. But I do think that there is a sense that you have to be pretty careful if you're going to withdraw to anticipate what you could be facing after you withdraw. Uh, and I think in this case, the lesson is going to be, be very careful about unilateral withdrawals uh, in the future. Now, the truth is unilateral withdrawals that are strictly unilateral, meaning there's nothing that's coordinated, nothing has been negotiated, nothing is understood. I do think as a rule of thumb, that's basically a mistake. Uh, in the, when, when Ariel Sharon withdrew, uh, he thought... He, he would have a set of understandings with the United States, and those would help to compensate for not having understandings with the Palestinians. He feared that if he made his withdrawal contingent on Palestinian acceptance, Israel would be stuck there and never be able to withdraw. And he saw that as the Palestinians determining Israel's future, not Israel determining Israel's future. So it was something that was understandable from an Israeli standpoint, at the time, I wasn't, this was the George W. Bush administration, and at the time, uh, I was outside the government, and I was making a consistent set of arguments that there needed to be run-throughs in advance of Israel withdrawing. There needed to be, if there weren't Israeli understandings with the Palestinians, there needed to be American understandings with the Palestinians. And the crossing points, they needed to, in a sense, establish a mechanism they would test for how the movement of people and goods would work to anticipate potential problems. None of that was done. Uh, and I would say that, again, within Israel, the lesson is largely, let's not withdraw unilaterally. What I'm beginning to transition into for you is, what should you do if you think about a withdrawal? The idea of, of leaving a place without an understanding with your, in a sense, with your putative partner is one thing, as long as you have understandings with others and the others have understandings say, for example, with the Palestinians. If America had had understandings with the PA about what it would do, uh, if the US had insisted on the PA establishing before, Israeli, before the Israelis withdrew, a set of demonstrations about what they could do from a security standpoint, a set of what they would do with regard, for example, to some of the greenhouses that were gonna be turned over to them. Uh, if it was understood that there were internationally, we had set up a set of expectations about what the Palestinians would do that would have raised the cost to the Palestinians of doing nothing. 
in the face of what was looting in the aftermath of the Israelis leaving. Uh, it would have established in advance not only expectations about how the Palestinians should perform, but also a set of standards that had to be met. One of the, I think one of the mistakes uh, at that time was not having Israel think in terms of, okay, we are going to demonstrate that we're prepared to take a step, but when we take the step, the Palestinians also have to demonstrate that they're responsible. It can't be that only Israel has responsibilities. The Palestinians have responsibilities as well. That should have been part of the setup. And there certainly should have been understandings with us, not simply related to what the U.S., position or commitments to Israel would be in the aftermath of this, but what the U.S. was going to do in terms of understandings and commitments that we would extract from the Palestinians in return for Israel withdrawing. Uh, it may be, and I suspect this is the case, for some time into the future, we're unlikely to see direct Israeli-Palestinian negotiations produce agreements. It doesn't mean that agreements may not be possible. But there may have to be parallel understandings between the United States and Israel and the United States and the Palestinians. And in a sense, Gaza withdrawal could have provided a very good laboratory for how that could work. That was an opportunity lost, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't draw the lessons about don't do something that's exclusively unilateral. Make certain, again, that both sides have responsibilities. And even if for reasons that relate to their political dynamics, they can't be seen as making a concession to the other. It's different if they're reaching understanding with us where they have to take certain steps. I would say that's the, the largest single lesson to draw from this. I, I agree with what Dennis said, and Dennis and I wrote at the time, we could show you the article, Jeff, uh, you know, don't just throw the keys over the fence and see who catches them. Um, in the case of, of, of uh, Gaza, it's really, it was a triangle. It was Israel, PA, Hamas. And this added a whole new dimension because there was a whole counter narrative going on. Uh, Israel's narrative was, you know, Israel's not going to be held hostage to the irresponsibility of the other side. The Palestinians think that this is such a burden for Israel that uh, Israel will agree to all their demands just so uh, the Palestinians could take Gaza off their hands. No, Israel wouldn't play that way. Sharon had his domestic politics, if you recall. The referendum was defeated within the Likud. He wanted to show that he was doing this without, you know, regard to, to Abbas's wishes. But the, the problem, and I totally agree with Dennis about the need to coordinate, is not the same as, as a full ne blown negotiation. But a third party was looking at what was going on here, and that was Hamas. And they are counter narrative, which is, you know, better, you know, four years of an intifada than 10 years of negotiations. So they, they interpreted what Israel did was weakness. And therefore, when the, uh, when the parliamentary elections were held in 2006, they won. Now, there were a lot of contributing factors uh, about how they ran candidates and districts. I don't, we don't have time for that. But the point is, is that Gaza was really the end of unilateralism. Israel pulled out of Lebanon. Israel built a security barrier during the second intifada. Then the third piece was this. But once Hamas won and fired rockets, then, you know, unilateralism became almost a dirty word in a certain way. And so it really had a huge impact. We're now at the 50th anniversary, and I'm glad you're asking us because no one has asked us so far. It's a big moment because in some ways the settlers lost the battle, but they might have won the war. They lost the battle because, as Dennis said accurately, there's zero uh, um, momentum for anyone saying, let's have a movement to go back and resettle Gaza. Out of a country of 9 million people where they can't even agree if it's light outside, there's nobody calling for going back to Gaza. So on one hand, that was clear that there was a defeat there uh, for that approach that 8,500 people should live among 2 million people, and those 8,500 should be surrounded by soldiers who were protecting them. And it didn't make Israel safer. So on one hand, they, they lost the battle, but, and here is the, the, the part of, I don't know if Dennis and I would agree, we haven't discussed it recently, but they, their goal was to make this so traumatic for the Israeli body politic that you'd say, look, if 8,500 is gonna be hard, you don't wanna try 108,000, which is exactly the number of people living outside the security barrier in the West Bank. And so their goal was not to win in Gaza, I think, but it was 
to win in the West Bank. I'll just end with one with one point. And that is Sharon, and, and Dennis and I write about it in, his, in our book together. And Dennis was the first drafter on, on the Sharon chapter. But what was striking here, and this should be somewhat, uh, you know, something to think in the future. You had someone like Ariel Sharon, who was the architect of the settlement movement, but ultimately he wasn't a true believer in terms of this is biblical patrimony. First of all, it's Gaza, not West Bank, which was already something else. But he believed, look, if the situation changes, your conclusions, your policy conclusions change. Once there was peace with Egypt <clears throat> and the Sinai was taken out of the battlefield, remember there were wars, 48, 56, 67, 73. And Sharon, who was a Southern commander in 71, saw Gaza as a place, you know, as a bulwark to stop, you know, Egyptian tanks from moving up the coast. But once there was peace, he said, well, what value does this have anymore? So it should be a reminder to us that when a geopolitical situation changes, leaders can change their mind. And someone as, as much of a settler, you know, architect as Sharon indeed changed his mind. As he famously liked to say, what you see from here, you don't see from there. Meaning when you're prime minister, you see a bigger picture. Uh, Dennis and David, uh, your answers uh, allow me pretty easily to segue to the Trump plan. And, and I'd like to start with, the thesis of the Trump plan and the critique it has of previous American efforts in the Middle East. And um, Doug Fife and Louis Libby, your counterparts to some extent at the Hudson Institute, wrote a paper recently where they argued uh, the thesis of the Trump plan, uh, which was in the past, US diplomacy aimed directly at a Palestinian-Israeli deal and repeatedly failed. This plan stresses that fundamental Palestinian reforms are required first, it assumes that current Palestinian leaders won't reform, so it appeals over their heads to the public they are misgoverning and around them to Arab states. And more directly, officials have said, uh, the plan seeks to show Palestinians that time is not on their side. How do you feel about that as a thesis and as a critique of previous American efforts? Let me answer it in a number of ways. I mean, first of all, any effort should be somehow informed by what the context is. David was making a reference to how Ariel Sharon changed because the circumstances changed. In our book, we talk about in a sense, how Yitzhak Rabin changed because the circumstances changed. Now, if you ask me, does the Trump plan reflect the change in circumstances? Does it reflect a set of, of fundamental assumptions that are different than, than before? The answer is it's a mixed bag. What the Trump plan is designed to do is, in one area, which I think is correct, signal the Palestinians that if you continue to hold out and always insist on 100% and not to concede anything, you're going to find that less and less is available to you. That, as an assumption, even as a signal, is actually, I think, well-informed. It's the right, right way to think about it. But if you want to be able to change and prove to the Palestinians that there's a high price in saying no, don't make it easy for them to say no. Don't make it easy for the Arabs to say no. The problem with the Trump plan is it makes it easy for everybody to say no, because the plan looks like it has no credibility in, in creating a Palestinian state. Now, I want to just tell a story here. I was sitting at the time the plan was finally unveiled with a senior Arab official from one of the Arab states that I'll put it this way, has become fatigued with the Palestinians. This is an Arab state uh, uh, that was open to adopting a different kind of an approach. Unfortunately, the administration didn't share any of the details with them in advance, uh, which is a mistake. Uh, and as a result, when this official looked at the map along with me, he was shocked by it. He said, you know, he said to me, you know, we were looking for a way to be responsive. We were looking for a way where we could stand up and say, this is serious. But he said, they, they've taken any potential for us to stand up and say it's serious because no one can look at that map and see a Palestinian state, which is carved up into, in a sense, little enclaves of territory and then is completely surrounded by Israel. Nobody can honestly say that looks like a state. Now, the irony is it would not have been difficult to create a map even a map that didn't come close to maybe what had been offered to Palestinians before, that would have been much more cohesive, much more coherent, 
uh, and not made the Palestinians look like they were getting an archipelago. The key here, again, was some of the premises built into the Trump plan actually made sense. But the substance fell short of what would have made it hard, that would have, that would have made it hard to say no, as opposed to easy to say no. And the process didn't make it easy for those Arabs who have grown fatigued with the Palestinians, who are tired of what they see as a sloganistic response to everything, uh, a, and a kind of reflexive no, if you don't get everything that you ask for, an unwillingness to actually sit down and negotiate at this point. Uh, but you also have to put those Arab states uh, that are in a position where they actually would like to do more of this, you have to make it easier for them to do that, not harder for them to do that. That's the problem, I think, with the Trump plan. And it's not just the substance of the process. If you wanted them to be responsive, then you had an obligation to sit with them, present the details of the plan to them, just as you had to the Israelis. Go over the maps with them. Take some comments from them. Work out with them in advance, quietly, what they would say, word for word, in response to your unveiling the plan. Put, up, put yourself in a position where... In a sense, you have the Arabs. If you have the Arabs, you're also going to have the Europeans because they won't be more Arab than the Arabs. Then you put the Palestinians in a position where the cost of saying no becomes high. That None of that, not the substance and not the process was done in terms of preparing the Trump plan. So some of the premises I even agree with, but the, but the substance and the process I think is problematic. Okay. I would like just to add, and uh, you know, Dennis said it well about don't make it easy for them to say no. And I agree with, uh, you know, the piece, Jeff, that you cited about they should know that they're going to be offered less if they keep saying no. And there have been three efforts before of the U.S. to hit the home run ball, Clinton in 2000, Condoleezza Rice in 2008 and 9. Dennis was involved in the first one, and I should also disclose I was involved in the third one, 2013-14. And now the Trump plan is the fourth effort. Uh, so on one hand, we're sympathetic to the, the, the sense that time is not on your side argument. But let me just show a map here of the Trump peace plan to, to visualize this for our, our listener, our, our viewers here that will get. Um, OK, so here's the map of the Trump plan. You could anyone who wants to get more into this, I have a website, Settlements and Solutions, that looks at every single settlement. And that'll give you a, a, a sense of uh, their, even how they voted, the numbers live there, the aerial photography and the like. Basically, what the Trump plan here, with the purple, it would be Israel under the Trump plan. And uh, the blue are the individual settlements. The yellow are Palestinian uh, towns and villages. And um, the idea is that... In, you know, and this is why the Palestinians don't like it, of course, but is that basically Israel is in charge of who goes in and who goes out of overriding security. So Israel is to the east in the purple. Israel is to the west in the purple. And Israel, you can't see, but in the gray above the West Bank, above the green line is, is the Galil, the Gali. And to the, the south is, is the Negev. That's Israel, too. So the Palestinians say, well, we feel encircled. You know, we're not you know, that we don't consider that a state. And you can see why they would come to that conclusion, frankly. Um, our view is that in general, these, you know, Dennis and I, I think we're, we're different from some of the other pundits, is that we are not always pushing this to the end. You know, hit, try to hit the home run ball, solve all the problems. We, if we had time here, we would go through a lot of details of why we don't think it's possible to end this conflict now. Um, we don't think we think they were valiant efforts in the past. We're not disputing that. But the Venn diagram between these sides do not overlap. Israel, the Netanyahu maximum and the Abbas minimum are just not overlapping. So I'd like to come what, I, what we see as, as the solid single here uh, to try to do less, but to achieve. I have my doubts that Abbas can agree to a historic compromise that where the Palestinian refugees can only go to the West Bank and not to Israel. Uh, and so, you know, I think we tried, but it's enough already uh, to try and, uh, you know, the, the idea of insanity doing the same thing over and over and hoping for a different result. So I would try for a solid single that would at least keep the door open for two states. I'll go to the next slide of is a two state uh, possible. 
And, and that will give you a sense of where this, also where the settlers live. Remember this slide of the Trump plan. Most of the settlers live to the left of your slide that are known as the blocks. That's the security barrier. Some of you have been to Israel, been to the West Bank, and the red is that security area. Um, and most of the settlers live closest um, to the what's called the green line, the pre-67 line, because many of them work in Israel. They work in Jerusalem. They work in Tel Aviv. They're lawyers, doctors, like everybody else, accountants. But so most of the settlers live there. So, I mean, what Dennis and I try to do in this book and I don't know if we have the slide here on the table of is a two-state solution possible. If we do, it would be great to bring it up. Uh, and if we don't, I'll just I'll walk through it very quickly. And that is just that 358,000 uh, live in this side of the barrier closest to Israel. It's about 7 or 8% of the West Bank. If you include East Jerusalem, Israel doesn't call it a settlement. So we have both numbers. The number gets to 84%. And what you see is on the Palestinian side, inside that barrier, there's relatively few Palestinians, 5%. If you include East Jerusalem, and we think most Palestinians should be in a, in a, have an area in East Jerusalem that is theirs. And even the Trump plan has a corner, but we feel insufficient. But if you say, so David, now I get it. I didn't understand this before, now I get it. So you're telling me inside the barrier, it's 77% of the settlers are there. And you're telling me 5% of the Palestinians are there. But once you get outside that barrier, then the numbers shift. 95% of the Palestinians live outside the barrier and 23% live uh, of the settlers live outside the barrier. So we think that there's a point that demography meets geography. And so our point is not that you can necessarily conclude a, a two state solution, but you could leave the door open for gradual progress. And the real story that you don't read about that much in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and no disrespect to any of them. But what you don't read about is how the Israelis and Palestinian security services are working together uh, to keep this area stable. They're doing it for the Palestinians for their own reasons, which I think is the most sustainable uh, if people do it for their own self-interest. So what we're trying to say is we don't think the Trump plan is workable, even though, Jeffrey, we could, we could see the point made that you cited, that namely the, the importance that Palestinians realize that time is not on their side. But we want to hit a solid single. We want to say, here, Israel, just build inside this barrier. There will be offsets. We call them land swaps. I don't know if we have time to get into that. And, but we think the Palestinians have to assume responsibility, too. It's not just about what does Israel do. A single for them is, don't give money to relatives of suicide bombers who, uh, you know, who perpetrate violence and things like that. What message does that send to people? You know, that if there's money that goes to these relatives, that you're encouraging, incentivizing violence. We think each side has to do at least one thing that's hard, but that would convince the publics on both sides that there is a partner. And it's important that these are the two issues, whether it's land for the Palestinians or counterterrorism for Israel, those are the Kishka issues. Those are the issues of the gut. And you've got to appeal to the publics on both sides to their gut. So we think all or nothing in the Middle East is always nothing. And we would like to see a solid single that would create a sense of partnership while there's at a time of profound disbelief of the publics on both sides. Can I, ask, can I just add one point to this? Just to, to follow up on what David is saying, the fundamental problem with the Trump plan is that it, it is so unattractive to the Palestinians that they will prefer one state. And the problem with the Trump plan related to that is that the Trump plan basically absorbs all of the settlements in Israel, not just those that are within the blocks that make it possible to create separation between the Israelis and the Palestinians. You build in the blocks, which is a concept that we developed back before we went to Camp David in the summer of 2000. You build in the blocks, that's consistent with a two-state outcome. You build outside the block, that's what, David, that's what David is showing. That makes it impossible to separate Israelis from Palestinians. If it becomes impossible to separate Israelis from Palestinians, you have one state for two people. Now here, we're not in the post stage in the Middle East. Every single place in the Middle East where you have more than one identity, national, tribal, or sectarian, you have a state that is functional or at war. So if you want 
to be, if you want what is currently Israel to become, to, to become like Lebanon, to become like Syria, to become like Iraq, to become like Syria, that's what one state will do. Uh, one of the people closest to Marwan Barghouti once said to me, his name is Ahmed Ghanem, he said, look, in one state, the Israelis will try to dominate us, we'll try to dominate them, we'll fight forever. If you want to ensure a conflict forever, if you want to ensure instability forever, then one state for two people is your answer. What David and I are talking about is we can't produce two states anytime soon. And we can get into all the reasons that's the case. But if we preserve separation as an option, maybe somewhere down the road we can produce it. And what we don't want is decisions that are tactically taken today create a long-term strategic consequence. And that's very much what the book was about. We focused on leaders who understood the difference between strategic and tactical. And in a sense, we're asking Israeli leaders today, recognize the difference between strategic and tactical. This is Jeffrey Herbs, president of American Jewish University, talking with Ambassador Dave, Dennis Ross and David Makovsky uh, from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy uh, about Middle East negotiations, past, present, and future. Let me just talk a briefly, uh, ask you to speculate about a potential Biden uh, administration approach. And, you know, one way to look at a Biden administration approach was to look at the thesis of the Obama-Biden administration, which was different and which seemed complicated in lots of ways we can't go into. But, you know, starting with uh, President Obama's Cairo speech in 2009, he highlighted settlements as um, a critical issue, perhaps the critical issue. And then eight years later, uh, the U.S. abstained on U.N. Resolution 2334, uh, which declared all of the settlements illegal. And Dennis, you've written in the past that this moved the settlements issue from a political issue to a legal issue. Um, yes. And had the effect to editorialize, starting with the first Obama and then Yahoo meeting, of boxing then Yahoo in, in, in yes. ways. Now, there are supposedly 2,000 advisors to Biden on foreign policy, uh, hard to say what will happen, but a lot of familiar names from the Obama administration there. And of course, Vice President Biden himself was an important force on foreign policy in the previous administration. Is that reasonable to think that um, the, the settlement thesis of the Obama-Biden administration would be uh, an important guiding principle or has time moved on also uh, for a possible democratic administration? Well, let me start with that. Um, I guess I would answer in a number of ways. Biden was the vice president, he wasn't the president. He obviously gave his advice, as he said frequently he would do it one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I was in many meetings with the two of them where uh, sometimes the vice president would react, sometimes he would not. I can tell you this, I was in, I'll just say it, I was in many battles within the administration. Uh, some were on the settlement issue, others were on Iran and other things. Uh, I can tell you that in every single case, uh, Vice President Biden backed the arguments that I was making. Uh, his position generally towards Israel has been shaped by not just a long standing relationship, but an, an emotional attachment to Israel. So on these issues, uh, I would not say he is exactly the same as President Obama. For President Obama, the settlements were an issue from day one in a way, by the way, that they should not have been. They were overstated. Uh, there was never a readiness to differentiate among settlements. Not all settlements are equal, as we've just been saying. Settlements that are within the blocks that are consistent with a two-state outcome should not be treated as being the equivalent of settlements that basically would preclude a two-state outcome. Uh, I do believe that, uh, that Vice President Biden will approach the Israelis uh, somewhat differently than, than President Obama. You know, this is not something that one can fully outline and predict, but his instincts on this issue generally, I think, were different from President Obama's. When President Obama came in, he was coming in in a context in which he felt the, the Bush administration had engaged in a war on terror. That wasn't just a war on terror, but was perceived in the Middle East as a war on Islam. He was fine with focusing on terror. He was not fine with what he considered to be uh, something that actually contributed to, to terror and the recruitment of terrorists because it looked like we were fighting Islam. So he decided he had to show how different he was from Bush. 
one of the areas he chose to, to show he was different from Bush on was on Israel, to show there would be some distance between the U.S. and Israel, because he actually said in one meeting in July of 2009 to a group of uh, Jewish leaders that for eight years there was no daylight between the United States and, and Israel, and what did it get us? And the truth is that wasn't great history. Uh, the fact is there was some daylight, and he was saying, what did Israel do? Well, one thing they did is they actually withdrew from Gaza. And what did they get for withdrawing from Gaza? Turns out they got rockets withdrawing from Gaza. So my, you know, in, in my time in the Obama administration, uh, I felt on the one hand, President Obama was actually very good on Israeli security. Uh, he doesn't get the credit he deserves on Israeli security uh, for those who criticize him. In fact, the Trump, you know, when the, the security assistance that we give to Israel today is the Obama MOU. Trump has not added one penny to it, notwithstanding the reality that Israel is having to carry out many more operations dealing with blunting the Iranians in places like Syria. And, and those are high cost operations that wasn't programmed into the monies. In any case, President Obama doesn't get the credit he deserves on the issue of security. The criticism of him on settlements, I think, is warranted because there was no differentiation. And the problem, as, I, as you quoted me as saying, problem with 2234, the Security Council resolution done in December on the way out, it reflected more the anger at Obama, uh, I mean, the anger of Obama at, uh, at Netanyahu, uh, because of what Netanyahu had done with the Congress on Iran and the like. This was, this was a, a, a resolution that made very little sense. We didn't vote for it. We abstained. Uh, and that allowed it to go through. The problem with that was it undid a lot of the substantive advances, at least at an international level. Because one of the problems was, A, as you said, all settlements were referred to as illegal. Well, how are you going to do settlement blocks and swaps if all settlements are illegal? The other problem was it said, A, June 4, 67, the border, unless the Palestinians agree otherwise. But we had built a consensus and understanding on settlement blocks and swaps, which means by definition, June 4, 67 cannot be the border because you're going to absorb these block areas into Israel and then you'll have an offset, as David said, you'll have swaps. But swaps. But if you're saying June 4, 67 is there unless the Palestinians agree otherwise, you give the Palestinians a veto over what the border can be that is inconsistent with what we had developed. So. There were moves by in the Obama administration that you can tell I very much disagreed with. Uh, and you know, I don't believe that Vice President Biden, from my experience, would simply be a reflection of everything that was done in the Obama administration. I would just add very quickly that also American priorities today are a bit different. I mean, in this era of the corona uh, and other major issues with China and the like, I don't think you're going to see uh, like a Middle East envoy named on day two, like you had with George Mitchell at the start of the Obama administration. And also the fact that you had a, a Democratic administration that by the end just came to the conclusion, as I said before, you know, you've tried three of these uh, hitting, trying to hit the home run balls on these issues uh, of solving the whole conflict. And, um, and now we have Trump with a fourth effort. I don't see someone saying, OK, let's try a fifth time. There's an understanding that the, that what I've been saying all along that the Venn diagram here just just does not overlap between Netanyahu and Abbas, and I think that's going to lend itself to more incremental moves, which I think is a good thing. And uh, I associate myself with the criticism of the Dennis uh, level that, of, of, of that administration. I was a part of it uh, for a time, uh, and I, I I really do think Biden is going to be different, both for the macro environment has changed and the fact that having gone through this before, I don't think there's going to be a, a political appetite to, to try to swing for the fences. How much of this centers around Netanyahu? Um, at some point, he will leave power. Uh, predictions of his demise have often been wrong. Have been wrong so yeah. I don't know when. Um, but how much of, uh, of the analysis uh, and prospects depend on him being or not being prime minister? Look, I do think leadership is fundamental here on both sides. And uh, we, we've seen with Abu Mazen is that uh, maybe there was a time when he was 
inclined to, to make a deal, but I think it's been a long time since he somehow felt ready that he could uh, make any concessions. And he hasn't. He basically has walked away from any concessions whatsoever. I think in the case of Prime Minister Netanyahu, there have been times in the past when he clearly was prepared to make concessions. Um, but I think we're also at a point where the level of disbelief among the Israeli public about the Palestinian purpose is so great that there's no real constituency within Israel to contemplate any kind of uh, concessionary moves towards the Palestinians. So that, again, it comes back to the argument that, that David and I make, which is uh, he says it's time for singles. He likes his baseball analogies. Uh, I tend to go more for less baseball analogies and talk about incremental versus uh, comprehensive. There can be incremental moves because the climate on both sides only permits incremental moves. And because you don't have the leadership on either side that is prepared to take really hard decisions vis-a-vis -vis the other side. That will be made more difficult on the Palestinian side by succession, because succession periods are not times when you compete to see who can be more accommodating, you compete to see who can be more pure. On the Israeli side, you know, I think you have to build back into creating a constituency within Israel that believes you can take risks with the Palestinians. You can make concessions towards them. You don't have that. Con you don't have that constituency right now. Although there is a way into it, and in, in part, it can be by making these incremental moves or or doing the singles that David talks about, and or, and this there's a relationship here. It can involve steps that Arab states take towards Israel to increasingly normalize, and as they normalize. They can all, they build their own credibility with the Israeli public when they say, look, we can do more, but we also need to see you take certain steps vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. One of the ways to ensure that there is a kind of broader movement is if this convergence of strategic interests between Israel and the Sunni Arab states, they see Iran the same way, they see the Muslim Brotherhood the same way, they see Al Qaeda the same way. Uh, and that creates, at least below the table, a fair amount of cooperation. When you can begin to put some of that on top of the table, that also can begin to change the climate within Israel, even as they think about the Palestinians. So it's not just to focus on Prime Minister Netanyahu and say, gee, if, it's, if he just wasn't the one there, I think one has to recognize that ignores the reality. That there's a larger context here. And the Israeli public has become disbelievers of Palestinians. To be fair, just as pal the Palestinian public are Israelis. This is Jeffrey Herps of American Jewish University. I've been talking with Ambassador Dennis Ross and Dave Makovsky, both of the Washington Institute. This was advertised as the advanced class in Middle East negotiations. I think, Dennis and David, thanks to both of you, it has been. We're really grateful for the time you've devoted to this and for sharing your wisdom, expertise, and long history in the region. Thank you.